I was living in Toronto, new to living in Toronto, and I was very lucky to move in some of the same circles as a woman named June Callwood. June was an author and a journalist, but she was also an iconic social activist. She used her position and her, her notoriety and her power to make change for people that didn't have the same. She was the people's voice. She used to always say when she spoke, if any of you happens to see an injustice, you're no longer an observer. You're now a participant, and you have an obligation to do something. Man, those words got in my head. They coaxed me to take a stand. They helped me see firsthand that authenticity and integrity shape the culture around us, and they matter. Let me take you back to August of 1996. Uh, I was, as I said, new to living in Toronto, and I received a call from the International Olympic Committee, here and known as the IOC. And they invited me to join their site selection commission for the games of the 28th Olympiad. I rearranged things quickly, and for the next four months joined an elite 15-person team that traveled the world. Our job was to take the 11 cities that were bidding for the 2004 games down to the five finalists. So two things. First of all, this is a time when people wanted the Olympics. <laughs> there were 11 cities bidding. And second, it was a time when this process was still completely private, non-transparent. Everything happened behind closed doors. So it was the IOC's prize to give, the Olympics. The president, Juan Antonio Samaranch, he ran the show. He struck our commission. He instructed our commission each step of the way. It's pretty clear that we were pawns in his game. But I fully chose to play. This was the IOC. I'm 28 years old. I'm going to make a difference one day here. And so I joined another world. Luxury five-star hotel suites. Endless, lavish buffets and dinners and receptions. So many gifts that I had to actually send them home by UPS in the boxes. They'd be waiting for me when I got home. Cities would go to great lengths to win the Olympics. I had a private tour of the Hermitage and the Acropolis. I had breakfast with the King of Sweden. Dinner with the President of Brazil. Bishop Desmond Tutu, because by the time we got to Cape Town, it was December, dressed up as Santa Claus, carrying a red sack of carved wooden gifts for each of us. I still have the wooden turtle. That's the lengths cities would go to. But along the way, there were two moments that would change everything for me. The first was in Istanbul. So Istanbul did not have the same budget as other cities. I didn't know this at the time, but Istanbul has to run for every single Olympics. It's in their constitution that they don't get funding unless they go for a bid. So, of course, that meant they didn't have the kind of budget the other cities had. We didn't stay at the luxurious Four Seasons, we stayed at the Novotel by the airport. We didn't have the Mercedes vans, we had the big old almost school bus taking us around. And there was a moment where there were, and of course, there were no gifts. Anywhere. I looked in the closet, in the bathroom, like, where are the gifts? And in that moment, in that city, as I literally kept waiting for the gifts, at some point this thought entered my mind. Does this city really think they've got a shot at winning the Olympics? And I was like, oh, oh my god. Who did, how did I become this disgusting person? Who am I? Integrity matters, and I failed big time. But this was the IOC. This is the dream. Well, the dream came crashing down for me in 1999. So it was only a matter of time before what I had seen firsthand and this behind-the-scenes non-transparent process got exposed to the world for what it was. And that happened in the lead-up to the 2002 Salt Lake City Games. Finally, there was murmurs of gifts being exchanged for votes, gifts like four years of college education, facelifts, and luxury cars. And it caused, of course, the world's press to scrutinize the International Olympic Committee. It was still a private club, 
So they didn't have to really expose anything, but they were outraged and did an internal investigation. And at the end of that investigation, the International Olympic Committee held a press conference. And that press conference, this was the second moment that for me changed everything, and it was the moment there was no coming back from. Because a reporter asked President, all-knowing President Juan Antonio Samaranch, do you take any personal responsibility for the ethical crisis that has happened under your watch? And Sam Ranch, of course, said no. He took no responsibility. But worse, he deflected the blame and made some of his own members the scapegoats. This is an African gift-giving cultural problem, not the IOC. Expel the Africans. There's June in my head. If any of you happens to see an injustice, you're no longer an observer. You're a participant. And you have an obligation to do something. So I did. I held a press conference and called for Juan Antonio Samranch, president of the IOC, to step down from his post. I knew he knew everything. And if he didn't, he was incompetent anyway. And he shouldn't be in the job. It caused headlines all over the world. Takes me to a whole other story that I won't share today in fighting that IOC for a couple of years when they were open for reform. But I can tell you that leadership and integrity matter. This gift-giving culture that overtook the IOC almost brought down the Olympic movement. In fact, fractures of it are still fracturing all of these years later. I had a crisis of faith and leadership and I swore I would never, ever, ever be back. But it's why one of my favorite leadership traits is embrace contradictions. <laughs> never say never. Because it was in 2010 that my love affair for the Olympic movement was reignited. I was invited to come speak to Team Canada right before they marched into the opening ceremony in Vancouver. So biggest honor. I was going to be the last person to talk to the team. But that day was so full of contradictions. So first of all, that horrible accident with the Georgian Luge uh, training run happened in the morning and an athlete was killed. And so if you can imagine, we started Team Canada's pep rally with a moment of silence. Talk about contradictory ideas. I had prepared this speech that was so intense and so like uplifting and empowering, but it was based around this, this mood that I knew was taking over Team Canada. Because behind the scenes, we saw this own the podium program and what it had done. It would translate into 14 gold medals in the next 16 days. But at this moment, that was not the team that I had before the opening ceremony. I had a team in shock, sadness, didn't know how to be. And if you told me you're going to do comedy or your attempt at comedy because you're not a comedian to the Olympic team before the opening ceremony, I would have said never in my life. But in that moment, it was exactly the right thing to do. So I threw out what I was going to do, and there's Team Canada in front of me. And I start by saying, wow, we're at the Olympics. Amazing. Congratulations. I bet so many of you, when you were coming thought that when you got here, it would just be perfect because it's the Olympics. You've worked so hard, you've waited so long, but the Olympics are just life. And we don't know what's going to happen. Sometimes horrible things happen, surprising things happen. I remember in my day, uh, when Korea was my first games, and North and South Korea were very much tense. And so they signed a truce to represent peace during the games. And doves were the representation of that truce. They were on the flags and on the back of the medals, very, very meaningful. And in the opening ceremony, they released about 200 doves into the audience, and they landed on the flagpoles in the cauldron. And then 20 minutes later, they came in and lit the cauldron. And the doves went up in flames. In car it was like incinerating doves on the infield. We were dodging dead doves. Like, really, this is happening. So the team starts to loosen up. <laughs> They're kind of like, and then I say to them, it gets worse. So Speedo was the bathing suit provider for Team Canada, and for some reason chose the color white. Thanks, Speedo, for our bathing suit. First of all, nice choice. Second of all, they ran short of fabric. 
So they only had enough material for people that were competing in the first half of the games. So me on day six had to borrow somebody else's Speedo at the Olympics. So Team Canada is squirming and laughing. And then I did kind of a silly cheer called the beaver cheer. And a little figure skater stood up and went, I'm a beaver. And a big bobsleigh guy went up and went, I'm a beaver. And Team Canada kind of left this little ceremony, this pep rally, with a little pep in their step. And in that tiny moment, I was able to shift the tone a little bit so that the opening ceremony could take care of the rest. But the biggest surprise of that event for me was how Team Canada shifted the tone of the Olympics from my point of view. So much so that two months later, when I got a tap to please apply to be the next chef de mission to lead the team in London 2012, I really wanted to do it. I was even willing to go back into the system to do it. So chef de mission, chef means the chief, like chief of operation, not the chef as in French like cook. And if you're confused about what the chef does, don't worry, so was the hiring committee. So I went through two full rounds, the entire process, and even though I'd been tapped for the job, I actually didn't get the position. I lost four to two to another great candidate. But the chair of that hiring committee noticed that the two votes that I got were from the former chef de mission and the chief sport officer, the two roles that really rotate around this particular job. So thankfully, they took it to another round of interviews, and through that process, I became the chef de mission. But come on, this is the person leading the Olympic team of abroad, and we don't know what the role is? Over half the hiring committee doesn't know what that is? That's a challenge. This kind of matters. But I thought this is an amazing opportunity, and actually, my legacy from that role, part of it, was to define the role going forward so that this didn't happen again and we made sure to align and, and get the right people hopefully in the job. So I tracked my hours like a good accountant or lawyer or consultant. I put in 1,079 hours over two years without travel. Did I tell you it's volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I found that my duties were mostly in four kind of categories, leadership and ambassador and mentor and cheerleader. And in the first 18 months of the job, 70, or, or first almost two years in the job, just till I got to the games, 70% of the time was leader and ambassador. And at the games, that flipped entirely to 70% cheerleader and mentor. But I couldn't have been good here without this foundation here because cheer, cheerleader meant something. When the chef de mission shows up at your event, the athletes notice and it's important. The mentor side was also very important. Because of the mentorship, I was usually the first person on site when that dream didn't come true. So it's wonderful to celebrate the ceremony. The tough ones are the fifth, the seventh, the knocked out in the second round. That's when the mentor came in. But at least going forward, we knew what the job was. And I could define it clearly. And in 2016, Kurt Harnett became an amazing next uh, leg of this sort of chef de mission team for Team Canada. The only thing that kind of bugged me about Kurt being chef was that he took those four duties and he turned it into an acronym. And I love that kind of stuff. If anybody's seen great traits, you know, I live for that sort of stuff. So he took cheerleader, ambassador, leader, and mentor and made it calm. And so his team in Rio kept saying, we're going to be calm, we're going to be calm, which is really ironic because for me in 2016, I was anything but. So I was down in the Rio Olympics as an analyst for CBC. And a couple months before the Olympics, they brought the entire CBC Olympic team together for an offsite, a couple days together. Lots of interesting information, of course, traveling to Brazil, but mostly it was how to be on air, especially for people like me that don't have a journalistic background but are going to be representing CBC. And the biggest thing is that we have to be neutral. We're not cheerleaders. We're not allowed to go, yay, Canada. We have to go, Team Canada did this, not we. So it's always that distance, which I thought I was going to do really, really well at. And then this happened. 
It's been a surprising night out at the Olympic Aquatic Stadium. That's the first medal for a Canadian woman in swimming since 1996. Marianne Limpert in Atlanta won a silver medal in the 200 IM. And I wonder if former swimmers ever get excited about what's happening in the pool today. How about Olympic champion from 1992, Mark Tewksbury, who was here earlier. Here's his reaction as he watched in our someday space that result. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, so I was fired the next day. No, no, actually, so first of all, embrace contradictions. So on my, to my defense, I didn't know it was being filmed. So I was in the studio, and there wasn't enough time to get to the pool to see the race. So there was this little sort of portable that acted as our green room, and it was called the Sunday Space, and they had the CBC feed in there. So I ran in there to watch the race, and you see me turning, it's, it's the social media intern who was watching me do this, and about three minutes in, she thought, this would be really good, would it? <laughs> so she posted it, had over a million views, went through the roof, but get this, CBC embraced contradictions and changed their whole approach. So you see, I made it on the main network, with that reaction. Get this, they actually went as far as having my colleague in week two, Donovan Bailey, come in and react on tape to Andre de Grasse to try to reenact and recreate what had happened with Penny and I, which are all really great and cool, except no one went back to thank Gabriella Cook, the social media intern whose idea it was in the first place. No one thanked her. No one acknowledged her. How do you think her morale was by the end of the Olympics? Leadership matters. It shapes the culture around us. If you want a good culture, acknowledge, thank, and recognize your people. If you don't, it speaks for itself. About a year ago, I was invited by Swimming Canada to go down to Trinidad and do this really amazing thing. I was gonna be able to share my expertise on the male side of swimming because Penny and the women had such a breakthrough, now we've gotta to try to get that men's side going. And so I was invited to spend about three or four days with 16, 14 to seven year olds, the next gen of youth male swimmers. I was gonna do team building, goal setting, all that kind of stuff, but unbeknownst, to one of the boys, before he'd gone down on this trip, his parents had reached out to me to tell me that he'd come out to them as gay. That then he'd gone to a provincial, champion, or provincial swimming competition and was horribly bullied and had since retracted and was completely withdrawn. I also heard that one of the bullies was going to be in Trinidad on this trip. And so that last night comes there's June in my head. If any of you sees an injustice, you're no longer an observer. You're a participant, and you have an obligation to do something. So as those boys came together, and they sat down in front of me, and I started that last night, I just started by saying, so, I guess you all know I'm gay. You could have heard a pin drop. I said, you know, I don't ever talk about it, how hard it was, how it was like torture, how I would do anything to change who I was, but also how it didn't have to be that way. You see, in my time, there was this guy, Victor Davis. He was a hyper-masculine, alpha dog, aggressive kind of guy. He was so intense before your competition, he would put his whole torso in the water, push himself up with the lane rope, and spit on the lane rope in either side of you. That's how fierce he was. Well, Victor and I 
we hated each other. Well, Victor hated me, and I was terrified of him. He hated me because I led the cheers and I hung out with the girls. I was, avoided him at all costs. He would enter a room and I would leave it. That's just the way it was. But on the very last event of the very last day of the very last Olympic competition Victor ever competed in, I was on his relay. In fact, I handed off to him backstroke to breaststroke. And when, when we made that final, in the hours before that race, something happened. Victor came to me and he said to me, Tewksbury, first of all, no one thinks we can do anything tonight, not even our coaches, and we can win a medal. Second, I know I've been such a prick to you, man. I've been such an asshole for so long, but you're tough. You took it and you're so tough. And three, we need tough people tonight because we can do this and no one thinks we can, but we can. And I, to this day, don't know how it happened, but we won that silver medal that Victor thought that we could win. And from that moment on, we were like long lost, long lost brothers. All that crap that used to come between us just fell away because we'd gone through this thing together. I paused for a second. That's why it was so shocking when Victor was dead a year later. He went to a bar, picked a fight. Some guys were hitting on his girlfriend. That's what Victor does. They went out, waited for him to leave the bar. In their car, when he was in the middle of the street, they drove at him full force. He flew 25 meters, landed on his head, and never recovered. I carried his coffin at the funeral and spread his ashes at sea. That's how close we became. I don't think they breathed the entire time I was speaking. Guys, medals don't discriminate. People do. They don't care if you're six foot one or five foot two. They don't care who you sleep with, what color your skin is. They just care that you're the best at what you do. Medals don't discriminate. People do. Please don't be those people. This sport is hard enough. Have each other's backs, please, for me. And as the boys all nodded in unison, and they came up and took a selfie or a hug or shook my hand, I knew that a torch had been passed. And I hope that these boys know through my example that I'm living proof, proof that sometimes the road of most resistance makes us who we are. And that's OK. Because as tough as it might be sometimes, isn't it so much harder to work and live in a place where you can't be yourself, be authentic? I think it's so important to feel aligned with values, with some form of integrity. I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it also to be part of a culture that shapes and gives meaning and impact to the world around us. But where does that start? I think that starts with us, because each of us, in our own way, shapes the culture around us, by who we are, by what we do. We are the culture. And to paraphrase June Callwood, we have an obligation to do something, even if that something is simply to ask, what kind of culture do we want to create and be a part of? Because if we don't ask that question, then who's going to? If we don't ask it, who will? If not us, then who? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.